I often ask audiences when I start, um, if you were to take a, a dart and just toss it at the United States of America, a map thereof, and hit any state, um, how many of you would feel comfortable if your child or grandchild were arrested in that state, in a particular city, anywhere in that state, and taken into a juvenile justice system. Um, I asked the question, how many of you would feel comfortable that uh, the appropriate diversion programs would get your child out if uh, it were a minor offense? Uh, that your child would not be detained unless it was absolutely necessary? That if your child had a hearing, that your child would get quality representation with an attorney properly trained and resourced to really look after the legal interests of your child? and that if your child were taken into custody, that your child would be treated fairly and would benefit from the, the uh, detention and, and residential confinement uh, over the long haul. And when that child got out, that your child would be better the, at the end than your child was at the beginning. And if I ask people to raise their hands, and I do that often across the country, uh, in an audience like this, in an audience of lawyers, an OJJDP conference, an audience of prosecutors, an audience of doctors, audience of regular citizens. I usually see maybe one or two hands out of 100. What that tells me is that we here in our country, this great country of ours, do not have confidence in our juvenile justice systems. In spite of a decade of reform, we still are finding ourselves feeling like, well, it's a good place for somebody else's child, but not my child and my grandchild. That's very uh, striking and something that we need to always keep at the forefront of my, our minds. I have five children, I have seven grandchildren, and I'm always concerned that I want to leave a better America than what I found, that I want to cooperate and collaborate with law enforcement, with prosecutors, with juvenile justice specialists, with judges, as I have for most of my career, rather than simply working with a narrow group of folks who are partisan in one way or another in the, in the juvenile justice system. We've made great advances in knowledge about adolescent development and the neurosciences, particularly in the last 10 years. What a lot of folks don't realize is that this is really new knowledge. It wasn't here a little over a decade ago. We have, great, uh, we have reason to really thank the MacArthur Foundation for all the research that they did that actually guided the United States Supreme Court in their major landmark decisions and that have guided, has guided them in, in subsequent decisions, Roper, Graham, Miller, all are based upon that solid research that tells us that children are different from adults. We also have a vast resource that tells us that we need to shrink our juvenile justice system. Way too many kids are involved in it. That we need to focus those resources that are remaining in our system on those children most in need. That those resources need to be guided by assessments that really address the unique problems that our children face that we can still hold our kids accountable, either in diversion programs or in deep end programs, that we can really reduce reoffending. We know now that we can still maintain public safety because community after community after community across the nation, in Texas, in New York, in Illinois, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Connecticut, the people who are running those systems are telling me and telling many of you Many of you know, because you come from those places, that they are able to do these things that I'm talking about and really to dramatically reduce the cost at the same time. The Coordinating Council of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is chaired by the Attorney General. I'm co-chair of the, of the, of the uh, Coordinating Council. And the Attorney General summons us together once every quarter to talk about the trends in juvenile justice. Recently, when we had the unveiling of the National Academy of Sciences report on um, adolescent development as a principled approach to reforming juvenile justice in the nation, the associate was there in place of the Attorney General, and we had the benefit of having Commissioner Gladys Carrion from the state of New York talk about her experiences in the state of New York. And, and the specific things she said really struck a chord with almost everybody in the audience. Commissioner Carrion said something really quite simple. When I took over the reins in our juvenile justice system in the state of New York, we had 36 institutions for deep end kids, secure confinement. She said it was costing us between $260,000 and $280,000 per year per child. 
260, $280,000 per year per child. And, and the recidivism rate was 80%, 80%. Now, when you hear that stat, you as legislators say, well, you know, are we getting the best, you know, you know, resource, best response for our dollars we're spending? Absolutely not. And so Commissioner Carrion, with the support of the governor and others within the state, began to shrink the system. As I understand it, they have uh, eliminated uh, at least 21 of those facilities, and they've saved millions of dollars, and they reinvested those millions of dollars in a variety of different ways, including robust community development programs that address the unique needs of kids closer to home and involving parents and the kids in directing the outcome of what happens to them. I think that's important to recognize, that we have all those tools that I just mentioned. Those are all at your disposal. If you read Sarah Brown's trends in juvenile justice that she provides for you, you see that same information. Because it's there. What we have to gather in our, in our midst is the willingness, the political power, the determination, the insistence, and that sense of urgency that if this were my kid, I really want to do something different because it's just not good enough for my kid, it's not good enough for my grandchild, it's not good enough for my niece, my nephew, or any other child. And we have to change our systems. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other things, and then I want to provide an opportunity to answer some questions. Um, we had Lori talk about ancient history in juvenile justice, and I think you have to go back to the beginning to understand a little bit about how far we've come. We've come a long ways, we've come a long ways, and uh, um, I've had the pleasure to meet Gerald Galt, whose case was the landmark case in juvenile justice, and talk to him a little bit about his experiences. Gerald started off in 1964. He was arrested for making lewd and lascivious telephone calls to the next door neighbor. Lewd and lascivious telephone calls to the next door. I don't even know if that's still on the books. Anybody know if that's still on the books anywhere? It's sexting now. I'm sorry? It's sexting now. It's sexting now. OK. <laughs> He was 15 years old in Scottsdale, Arizona. Without his parents knowing, he was taken into custody. His parents didn't find out where he was until late that evening. At the first hearing uh, and at every subsequent hearing, there were no witnesses. There were no charge sheets. Nobody testified against him. He didn't have any idea what the charges were. There were no transcripts of what was going on. And he had no legal representation. He was taken back to the detention center, stayed a couple more days, and was subsequently released. Then Gerald went back before the judge, at which time the judge issued a sentence. You are to be held until you're 21 years old. Six years. Until you're 21 years old. So off to jail he went. Now, if he had been an adult, the maximum sentence and fine was $50 and two months in jail. So we were clearly not treating our children better than our adults. The kids were getting the worst of both worlds, horrible um, treatment, and horrible due process. Justice Fortas, in writing the majority opinion, decreed basically that fundamental due process was being neglected, the right to counsel was imposed, the right to know, notice of charges, the right to a hearing with witnesses required to testify, Fifth Amendment rights and other due process rights were incorporated. And I think that that's the beginning. Well, where are we today? Well, we know a couple of things. We know about Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, my home state. 1,800 kids went before the judge between 2003 and 2008 without the benefit of counsel. 1,800. The court found that because the judges were receiving finder's fees, over $2 million, judges subsequently sentenced to 28 years in jail, that they vacated more than 4,000 cases. This is the worst case of judicial misconduct and violation of the constitutional rights of children or adults in the United States. They vacated the cases. They didn't just expunge them, they vacated them as if they never happened before. That's over 40 years after Gall. We also know that Shelby, uh, Shelby County, Tennessee, same kinds of issues, violations of the rights of children. Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department went in and filed lawsuits. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, where are the other places like these? Are there any others in America? Anybody think, anybody who believes that there are no other places like this in America, please raise your hand. You all are the legislators who have the power to change the direction of our country, change the direction of your states and your communities. If you can't raise your hand saying that there's not in my state, not that I know of in America, 
then we, we have to join together, we at the Justice Department and you, in trying to address the issues. Now, I don't want to say there haven't been a lot of changes because they're really high. In, <clears throat> in 1974, the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act was signed into law. Our office, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, was created with three core requirements. First, keeping out of detention status offenders. You see now, still we have the same issue. That's the MacArthur Foundation is focusing on it. Status offenders are truants, runaways. Kids often who have minor violations in schools are locked up. We have reduced the numbers by 97%. I'm very proud of that. That's a great accomplishment for our nation. But there's still thousands of kids being locked up for status offenses because they're kids. That's just not tolerable. We have to change that. We also had two other core requirements. One was sight and sound separation of juveniles from adults in locked facilities. We've reduced that by 98%. <laughs> but still, thousands of kids being directly in contact with adults. And what happens when, when you have kids in contact with, with adults? They're exploited. We all know that. That's why Congress passed the Rape Elimination Act. And that's why we're beginning the process of enforcing it through the Office of Justice Programs and applying to juveniles as well as adults. And we have some robust plans to address specific kinds of issues there. The other requirement was removal of juveniles from adult jails and lockups. And again, 97% have been removed, but still a large number of kids that are still locked up with adults. We could do better, and we have to. The fourth core requirement was reducing disproportionate minority contact which began in the early 90s, and on that one, we have not really made much progress. <clears throat> All minority youth are arrested in almost twice the rate of white non-Hispanic youth in 2008. African-American youth had the highest arrest rate, and they were arrested at more than twice the rate of white non-Hispanic youth. Our American Indian and Alaska Native youth had the highest rate of transfers to adult courts of all minorities, and almost twice the rate of white non-Hispanic youth. So we still have a ways to go. But you know, we need to recognize the progress and then ask ourselves, what is the pathway forward? And where do we go from here in order to really address these issues? One of the really major pieces, major changes that has come about that was actually started by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is the research project that I referenced earlier. The National Academy of Sciences was created by President Lincoln back in 1863. The purpose of the academy was to do scientific research on a neutral basis to give guidance to the federal government on how it should address issues and policies that would advance the, the, the expenditure of funds. The National Academies undertook the research project for OJJDP and has provided us with a guidepost, what I believe is a pathway forward, a document that really clearly states what we ought to be doing as we go forward in addressing the issues of juveniles in this nation. Now, we have asked the Academy to take a second look to help us in thinking about how to implement the report. We've asked them, the, the initial document was completed in November of last year, but didn't come out to June of this year. We've asked them that it, between the time of completing the research and releasing the report, were there any new developments, any gaps in the research? We've asked them to go back and take a look. We also know that implementation science is helping us understand how to implement new policies. I've been told that in the medical field uh, that it often takes 10 to 20 years for a new development in science to be actually implemented across the nation. Some areas, they move a little faster, for example, in areas of cancer. Some areas involving children, they move a little faster, but still you don't have an immediate response to a new development. So we want the, the uh, um, National Academy of Sciences to help us with implementation science, help us figure out how we can help you in the states experiment in different ways so that you can have an overall approach in your state to reforming the juvenile justice system. We've also asked him about something that really matters to all of us. We are in a nation that has serious financial constraints. How do we reduce the cost of uh, these reforms. We're at, we've asked the National Academy to bring its best budget analysts, its best cost-benefit anal analysts together to see if they can help guide us and guide you on whether it's going to make any difference to you on the bottom line of government as you reduce or change and reform your juvenile justice system. Now, we obviously believe that it'll make a big difference. 
We have evidence from California. We have evidence from New York. We have evidence in Texas that it does indeed make a difference. And we want to really give you a pathway forward so that you can experiment. Give us a pathway forward with you so that with our grant making programs where we have discretion, that we can work with you to help do some of the reform efforts. Now, a couple of things I really want to talk about about OJJDP so that I don't leave them out before I go to our Defending Childhood Initiative and our School to Prison Pipeline Initiative that we're working on. We support programs that work. If you have programs that work, we'd love for you to bring them to our attention. We'd love to help support research efforts to shine a bright light on your programs at work so we can share them with the rest of the nation. We're really eager to do that. We have a research division that can help with that. But if you have something that doesn't work, we also want to know that. Why? Because we want other states to recognize that if things aren't working, we sh none of us should be really investing in those kinds of programs. We believe in evidence-based practices and programs. We have a model program guide. If you go on our website, you want to know what kinds of programs that you can use for diversions, for detentions, for, for uh, community-based options. You can look at our model programs guide and find some help there. We also have crimesolutions.gov, which is used both on the adult side and the juvenile side to give you clear guidance on what's working in this nation. We've spent millions, at this point, billions of dollars on programs across the nation, both in the Bureau of Justice Assistance, National Institute of Justice, and others on programs. Well, what's really working? You shouldn't have to guess in your community every time you want to do something different. You should be able to find out what works. And so the government has put that out there so that you can, uh, you can see exactly what we know that works. Now, Mark Lipsky has done a little work recently because we were getting complaints, complaints from you, saying, you know what? I have some programs that work in my community, but they're not evidence-based. We can't afford the research necessary to get evidence-based programs. Congress called us and said, what about the little guy who doesn't have the money to do that? What can you do to help him? So Mark Lipsky has done some meta-analysis and he believes, and we're going to look closely at his work also, that there are a lot of small programs that need to be looked at from the point of view of working communities and producing good results for kids that we need to take a look at. So I'm asking my staff to take a look and do that. Now, we also believe in partnerships, one of the themes of this conference. We're working closely with the philanthropic community, clearly working closely with the, uh, with the MacArthur Models for Change groups. We're working with Pew. We're working with the Casey Foundation, the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. We're looking at the school to prison pipeline and an array of foundations that want to help us in you know, the pipeline. We're looking at girls programs, which have not really functioned very well in the juvenile justice context for a long period of time, with a variety of partners and possible philanthropic groups that want to take the lead, which we want to support. We're also, again, as I mentioned, working with Justice Reinvestment and the Pew Foundation, Open Society and the Ford Foundation on, on um, indigent defense. We, at the present time, do not have an overwhelming supply of resources at the federal government level, and certainly not at OJJDP. But we still have the capacity to make good policy. We still have the capacity to do some grant making. We still have the capacity to convene folks to talk about a lot of these issues, and we're using our resources for that. Another thing that's really important is that we believe in collaboration across the government. You know, if you're a kid, and you walk through the three, four doors you have in this room. One of them back there is education. Over there is the dependency system and the foster care system. Over there is juvenile justice. You know, and over here is drug and alcohol and mental health issues. Each door you walk through, there's a different name for what you're doing. They have a different set of terms. The education people don't always communicate with the people over here in mental health. The juvenile justice people don't always even communicate with the dependency people. You can be in the same courthouse talking a different language. Does that make any sense? Not to you and me, and to the kid, the children are totally oblivious to our total lack of ability to communicate. It doesn't make sense, folks. What we're doing at the federal government level is we're sitting down in one room with all these folks, Health and Human Services, SAMHSA, the Center for Disease Control, Education, and we're trying to develop a common language to talk about ch children. That common language is based upon the new adolescent development information we have, the new neuroscience that tells us about the, the, the domains for development of children. And we're trying to talk about what's happening in our shop as it relates to children wherever we find them, wherever we find them. And we think that that's going to make a big difference over the long haul. In addition, 
Again, we're working on issues related to girls, detention, diversion. We'd like to develop a robust continuum for diversions and share that with the, the states across the nation. We're working on youth law enforcement initiatives. Why? Because at the beginning of the system, we have problems between youth and law enforcement, particularly with African American and minority youth who have had a long-standing list of conflicts with, with law enforcement. Now, I've worked with law enforcement for over 10 years on this very issue. I'm pleased to say that I believe that there are lots of issues that we can work on in commonality that help reduce the tensions and conflict between youth and law enforcement. We've done it. We've developed a curriculum where we taught at the police academies throughout Pennsylvania. And we know that in Connecticut, there's a curriculum that was developed by, developed by the state police that also does the same thing. We know that right here in Boston, there are people who are doing training across the nation. We work, I personally work with the International Association of Chiefs of Police on this very same issue. There is no reason for us to leave for our children a generation of problems where law enforcement and youth can't communicate. That doesn't make sense. We're better than that. We are really much better than that. So we're gonna focus on this issue at the national level through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, through the Office of Justice Programs, and in other places in the federal government. We think that there are some, lo some solutions, and we look forward to addressing them. We're also interested in working with children who have significant mental health issues, and also children who have disabilities. Now, I want to leave some time for questions, so let me just touch briefly on our Defending Childhood Initiative, which is an initiative started by the Attorney General. We had a comprehensive research project that identified children who had been exposed to violence. The remarkable finding was that in the year prior to the research, 60% of our children had been exposed to violence as victims or witnesses, 60%. Again, the Attorney General was presented this information at a coordinating council meeting. That survey was shocking to him, and the Defending Childhood Initiative was born out of the findings. And I sat as co-chair of a task force that went across the country examining this issue. Our conclusion basically is that every child who walks through any door, any one of these four doors, any door that we control in our society, should have access to an assessment so that we can assess, identify, and treat any trauma that the child has, has experienced. We know that trauma disrupts the educational process, disrupts the developmental process, and so forth. The best example for me of this was Joe Torre, who was co-chair of the task force. As many of you know, Joe Torre is a famous baseball player, manager of the Yankees, and he's been known to beat a few baseball teams, some of which you may be aware of or familiar with. <laughs> Mine was one of them. And Joe told us a story which, which really kind of stuck with me. He said, when I was in my 50s, I was having self-esteem problems. Joe Torre headed to the Hall of Fame having self-esteem problems. Joe said that. He said, my wife had a conversation with me. Translation, go get some help. <laughs> and, and, and I met his wife, and she's a wonderful person. <laughs> and Joe went and got some help. And he discovered that domestic violence in his youth, in his home, his father was a police officer, had caused him a lot of problems. How many of our children suffer through domestic violence now? How many of our children are traumatized by community violence, violence in schools? and go without any benefit. That's what we need to take a look at, and that's what the Attorney General is recommending. Now, one thing I'd like to say is the Health and Human Services has put out a guidance that explains to states how states can fund all the assessments, treatments for children who, have who may have been exposed to trauma. And that's available, and that'll be available on our we website, it's available on the Health and Human Services website. The final thing is the school to prison pipeline. Again, I'm not gonna speak about it in, in detail, but the Council of State Governments did a research project on one million students from the great state of Texas. One million, which is an extraordinary number. And it found that for 7th to 12th graders, 60% of the 7th and 12th graders have been suspended or expelled from school during that time. Several of them multiple times. Suspension or expulsion reduces the likelihood kids are going to get, graduate from school increases likelihood of going to the juvenile justice system and onto the criminal justice system. And the Council of State Governments is now working with us for a consensus document that's gonna be the corner piece of our effort to, to eliminate the school to prison pipeline. Again, any of these issues I can speak about in great detail, I just want you to be aware of them. At this juncture, I simply like to say to you that we have a unique opportunity in our country at this moment. The knowledge is there. 
the research. I've only cited three or four of the major research projects that give us a clear guidance, a clear direction on what works for kids, a clear guidance and direction on what the problems are. Our National Academy of Sciences report, we believe, is the pathway forward for all the states. And we're going to be sharing that with the rest of the nation as often as we can. And as soon as we get our final report from the National Academies, we expect to implement it and go forward asking you to help implement it so that we can reduce the number of kids in our system and get better outcomes for our kids. It's up to you to make decisions about what comes next. No, we need your leadership and your guidance. It's not something that we at the federal government can do. I can tell you that if you can maintain and sustain the continued robust reform that's going on at the state level, if you can talk to your, your, your sister states and find out what's working for them, if you can incorporate a lot of these efforts. The great state of Michigan right now is having a major effort to eliminate the school to prison pipeline coordinated by a former Supreme Court justice on this very day. Other states are doing the same. They plan to end the problems that we're talking about. This is the time to embrace these reforms, to embrace this new knowledge. This is the time to work closely with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and Department of Justice to find ways to work effectively. We welcome your input. We welcome communications with you. We welcome coordination with you. I, am, I, I would love to come to any of your states to help or at least to learn from you what's going on and what's working effectively. And if we can find things that are working well, we will do our best to shine a bright light on it, to communicate across the nation with our communications tools to try and help produce a better nation for our kids. And again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure to speak to people who are on the cutting edge of change and innovation. And uh, uh, I, again, I remain available to you to talk about anything that we can do to strengthen your efforts to reform our systems across the nation. Thank you very much.